Thank you, and once again, good morning to students and teachers of the Word of God. Our lesson this week is on the intercessory work of the Lord Jesus Christ, continuing our lesson from last week. And last week we talked about Christ's qualifications as our great high priest, and we talked about Christ's atoning work being finished on this earth. We also discussed how Christ met the conditions of becoming a high priest. We gave you the verses that dealt with Christ being made a priest after the ironic pattern of the priesthood in some ways, and like Melchizedek and others, in that the ironic priesthood had to have a continual succession of priests to continue, while Melchizedek had no continuing priesthood because he liveth and abideth forever. And we talked about Christ offering himself as a sacrifice on Calvary to offer a completed, a completed finished atonement for sinners. Now, by far the most important thing when discussing the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ is to notice in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6 to verse 12, that Christ's completed finished sacrifice at Calvary was a once and for all final and forever act, never to be repeated or reenacted or continued by anybody. The blasphemous pagan teaching from North Africa that the Lord's Supper, which was said to be a memorial of Christ's death, or to be done in remembrance of him, was a substitute for Christ's death, or a continuation of Christ's death, or a reenactment of Christ's death, is what the 39 Articles of the Church of England call a blasphemous delusion and a dangerous deceit. Now, what it means in, a, in effect is that the entire plan of salvation is committed to men who minister to men, and they pretend they have the power and authority that only Jesus Christ has. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the Apostle and High Priest of our profession. Therefore, to call Simon Peter Prince of Apostles is some more nonsense and blasphemy. Who are you to be calling Simon Peter the Prince of the Apostles when the Prince of the Apostles is the Lord Jesus Christ himself? And who are you to say that Christ's death should be repeated or continued or reenacted when he said himself, himself said it was once and for all, finally and forever? Now, notice these passages in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, and Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6 to 12. Hebrews 3, 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, the apostle. There's your prince of apostles. Why, Simon Peter wasn't even in the same league. The prince of the apostles called Simon Peter Satan in Matthew chapter 16. And once, as I said before, an ounce of reading is worth a pound of bigotry. In Matthew chapter 16, where the Lord Jesus Christ is talking to Simon Peter about the rock, he turns right around and says to Simon Peter in the same chapter, verse 23, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. So to call Simon Peter the prince of the apostles, when the prince of apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, is some more of the blasphemous foolishness that is quite so that is quite prevalent in our age today and is so common and characteristic of the modern ecumenical movement. All ecumenical movements should get together at the expense of the truth. All ecumenical movements are designed to overthrow the authority of the Word of God and replace it with a group of men. So when you hear a man talking about the Prince of the Apostles, he simply doesn't know what he's talking about. The Prince of the Apostles is the Lord Jesus Christ, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. And don't get mad at me and don't get upset with me just because you're bigoted or lazy or wicked or stupid. You are a 20th century educated man, I suppose, and you can read third grade English, I suppose, and you can get a Bible in any dime store counter in America. So before you <coughs> strip the gears and burn out the clutch plate and blow out the gaskets, get your Bible and read it. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Jesus Christ is the apostle. If he wasn't the prince of the apostles, who was? Thomas, he's called the apostle, and he's also called the high priest. So we say people are priests that offer up spiritual sacrifices, and we have a high priest who's gone to heaven to appear in the presence of God for us. Now the place. It's said to be in heaven. Hebrews chapter 9, 1 to 8, tells us the responsibilities of this priest when it says Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by, own, by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews 9, 24, Christ is entered into 
heaven itself. Now, how many of you people have wasted your time and money supporting broadcasts and telecasts which make fun of the Christian going to heaven and try to convince you the Christian doesn't really go to heaven? Did you ever pick up that nonsense in a radio station or a TV station? What do you make of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24? The presence of God is said to be in heaven. Did you notice that? Hebrews 9, 24. Did you notice that's where you're seated with Christ in heavenly places? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. Did you know up there above the right, above principality, dominion, and power in this world and the world to come at the right hand of God in heaven is the Savior? But why would you let some third-rate jack leg kid you into thinking that when you died, you didn't go to heaven? Now, where does that not think you're going? To the ground? Why, the soul departs from the body at death. Jacob's body is buried 50 days after his soul is gathered to his fathers. Did you notice that passage in Genesis 50 and 51? Or Genesis 49 and 50 it is? In Genesis 49 and 50, Jacob is gathered to his fathers 50 days before his body goes anywhere. Now, who are these people trying to tell you that Sheol is the grave and hell is the grave and all this nonsense because they got a concordance and learned three Hebrew words? Who are these people? Can they read the Hebrew Old Testament? Bereshit bara Elohim, we have Hashemayim, we have Aretz, Shemu Yisrael, can they read it? Yat Shanayim, Shalosh Al-Baba, Himisha Shisha Shibu Shemona, can they read it? What are they doing telling you the Hebrew word means this and the Greek word means this when they can't read Hebrew or Greek and don't know what they're talking about? When Rachel died, her soul was in departing. Did you notice that in Genesis? When, so, when Paul died, he said, the time of my departure is at hand. Did you notice that? When Christ departed, he went to heaven. Hebrews 9, 24. Now, of course, we know technically that the abode of the Christian eternity is New Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven. I think we all know that if we know anything. We know that the Christian's abode is a city a mansion prepared in a city that comes down from God out of heaven. But our dwelling places with the Lord in heaven, we're up there seated with him in heavenly places right now at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Hebrews 9, verse 24. So don't let some monkey get on there and tell you you shouldn't go to heaven. Whoever heard the Christian going to heaven, the Christian going to go to heaven, all that nonsense. You know what Paul said about his excursion into the, into paradise? He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 5, that he was caught up into the third heaven. Did you read that? Now, this brings up one of the great problems of America, and of course, the mystery of iniquity as it gathers is more mysterious by the minute. But why people who profess to be the Bible would support broadcasts and telecasts to tell the Christian he's not going to go to heaven when he dies is absolutely amazing when you consider it. When Paul was stoned and left for dead out there in the road outside of, the, of Lystra, he was caught up to the third heaven and saw what God had prepared for them that love him. When John was caught up to New Jerusalem and saw it, he was caught up to heaven. And when Christ returned, he went back into heaven, Hebrews chapter 9, 24. Now, why you let some monkey bleed your pocketbook and take your funds out of your pocket for that kind of nonsense? What do you do that for? The place is in heaven. Now Christ appears in the presence of God for us in heaven. And when I say for us, this answers the question, for whom? Well, for his own. Hebrews 9, 24 says, Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Christ said, I pray for those whom thou hast given me. I pray not for the world. He's praying for us. Isn't that a marvelous verse? You people that doubt eternal salvation, you people that run around your screw loose, play on about half the deck during the daytime, don't know whether you're saved and guess you're saved and think you're saved and hope you're saved, or messing around Acts, Matthew, and Hebrews and worrying about the unpardonable sin. Some of you Christian kooks, did it ever occur to you that if you're saved, Jesus Christ is praying for you? With him praying for you, how do you miss? Do you know if anybody ever prayed for the wound up in hell? Give me an example. You say, Judas, why, Judas was a devil. 
John 6, 70. When Christ prayed, he said in John 17, verse 9, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And now I am no more in the world, John 17, 11, and I am come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Now, isn't that amazing? Here bunch of you people thinking you can lose your salvation by judging your conversion by Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was a Jew, and you're not. He died before the resurrection, and you didn't. He didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit coming after the resurrection, and you do. And if that wasn't all, he wasn't just a human being. In John chapter 6, verse 70... Christ said, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Ever meet a saved devil? Why, some of you people I'm talking to let these water dogs and candlelight kid you from morning to night into thinking because Judas lost salvation that you can lose yours. Ain't that a flip? Why, Judas believed and was baptized and repented and confessed. And he's in hell. Somebody said, that proves it can happen to a Christian. You're out of your mind. He was a devil. John 6, verse 70. I didn't say it. Jesus Christ said it. Get in a fight with him. Not me. People are funny, aren't they? They get terribly upset when God says something plain that contradicts what they've been taught. And when God says something plain that contradicts what they've been taught by tradition or by custom or by habit, they get so disturbed and begin to holler about the preacher. <laughs> Folks are weird, aren't they? Christ now appears in the presence of God for us. The basis of his intercession for us is his finished work. We read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, He entered heaven by his own blood. In John 17, 1 to 26, Jesus often speaks of this finished work. And for those of you who doubt whether or not you're saved, let me tell you what to do, and you can settle the matter in less than 25 seconds. Number one, stop trusting any church, work, or sacrament, or feeling, or experience for salvation. Number two, rest your soul, your naked soul, on the naked Word of God, on the finished work of Jesus Christ dying for your sins, and then on your knees, read John 17. And if that doesn't work, there's no cure for you, brother. You're headed for the state hospital. There isn't a man alive on this earth who ever received and accepted the finished work of Jesus Christ and rested on that finished blood atonement entirely for salvation and believe the Word of God that ever doubted his salvation. The only people who doubt their salvation are people who are counting on their works to justify them, or their sacraments to justify them, or obeying their church to, to, to uh, justify them, or emotional experiences. You cannot rest your soul in the naked Word of God and the finished blood atonement of Jesus Christ and doubt salvation. And every doubter I'm talking to is trusting something else. Christ up in heaven before the presence of God and in the presence of God at the right hand is making a plea for us. And in his prayer for us, he's praying that God will give us the grace we need, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that God will give us strength if we're weak, John 17, 11, that God will keep us from sin and temptation, John 17, 15, that will be forgiven and cleansed when we confess our sins to him, the great high priest, 1 John 1, 9. That will have power to witness for Christ, Acts 1, 8. And our final destination will be complete, will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 29. And the purpose of these petitions is to sustain life, Hebrews 9, 24, to clean us, 1 John 2, 1, to give us grace and help when we need it, Hebrews 4, 15, and 16, and to secure victory, Hebrews 2, verse 17, 18. <clears throat> now, I'll go over those verses again in case you didn't get them. If you'd like to write them down, I'll get them to you again. And these verses deal 
with Christ's present work in heaven on behalf of those who have believed on him and trusted him. And people who count on their emotional experiences to save them can never lay hold of any of these because they are basically at heart Bible-rejecting Christians. However, the Bible-believing Christian has something else. The Bible-believing Christian has the great and precious promises that tell him that right this minute the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for him to this end. I'll give you the verses one more time. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. John 17, 11. John 17, verse 15. 1 John 1, 9. Acts 1, 8. Romans 8, 29. Hebrews 9, 24. 1 John 2, verse 1. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16. And Hebrews 2, verse 17 and 18. These verses show the believer is absolutely, eternally secure in Christ and in God, with God in him and Christ in him and him in Christ and Christ in God, and the three is one. For the Lord Jesus Christ praying and making intercession for him daily before the throne of grace. Jesus Christ is my advocate now. We read that Satan is the accuser of the brethren at the throne of God in Job chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 12. And to counteract the accusation of Satan, the prosecuting attorney, we have a defense attorney in heaven. We have a lawyer in God's court. Our lawyer advocate is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Let me read in 1 John 2, verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you that you sin not, but if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. The sacrifice becomes the lawyer, the slain lamb becomes the attorney for the defense at the right hand of God. And when we sin, he pleads for us on the ground of his own finished work at Calvary, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, you talk about a great and precious promise. What do you suppose that one is that I just quoted? If we confess our sins, he, the great high priest, the prince of the apostles, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us more in righteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all, a double -L, L, all sins. Now, what do you make of that? Somebody said, well, preacher, you don't know what I did. I don't give a flip what you did, neither does the Lord. What the Lord is interested in is, will you take the cure? Here's a man that says, well, my, I've got a venereal disease because I was born that way, and it's my father's fault or my mother's fault or my grandparents or something. The Lord isn't interested in that. If the thing can be cured, what he wants to know is, will you take the cure? It's absolutely hopeless and helpless and useless for you to argue about how you got in the condition you're in. We're fallen creatures, Adamic creatures. We're fallen and depraved and lost and dead and trespassed and seen in our natural condition. And apart from a new birth, we're hopeless and helpless. And our great promise is, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, will cleanse us from all sin. What you need to do is claim the promise. He said, Brother Ruppin, if you just know what I've done, I don't care what you've done. I've got a promise that says A-double-L. -L. If it says A-double-L, -L, it means A-double-L. -L. It didn't say all sin but adultery. It didn't say all sin but dope peddling. It didn't say all sin but bestiality. It didn't say all sin but kidnapping. It didn't say all sin but murder. It didn't say all sin but uh, perversion. It didn't say all sin but extortion. It said all sin. A double L, all sin. We have a merciful and, merciful and compassionate high priest, and he can cleanse us from all sin. Forgive and cleanse. Forgive, that's negative. Cleansing, that's positive. So Jesus Christ offers to be your intercessor today. I have him as mine. Before this microphone, before this broadcast, I tell you, as sure as I am sitting here and breathing and reading the Word of God and talking to you today, 
that I have an intercessor, a high priest at the right hand, the throne of God, and when I go to him, I don't go to bellboys, secretaries, vice presidents, car hops, and chauffeurs. I walk right through the main door into the front office and go down and sit down across the desk from him. He's my father. I don't have to ask Mary, please let me in, or blessed Joseph, blessed John the Baptist, would you get me to the upstairs room or sit down in the waiting room? Are you crazy? He's my father. And my older brother is making intercession for me when I get in trouble. Now, can you beat that? Come now, saith the Lord, let us reason together. Though your sin be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Wherefore, he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren. Christ said, Whoever will do the will of my Father, the same as my mother, sister, and brother. I've got an older brother in the office. When I mess up, he goes to bats for me. I walk in the office, I'm dealing with my father. The prince of the apostles in my apostolic hierarchy is Jesus Christ. My high priest is Jesus Christ. And I walk in the office and lay my accounts on the table. Now, do you have that intercessor? In times of severe trial, we ought to be glad to have a true friend at court. When an accusation comes up, the Savior stands ready at the court of heaven to assist us. And I say he is willing to be your personal representative to the Father. He's mine. Is he yours? When you pray and place your case in his hands, he'll take care of your case, and he never lost a case yet. You talk about Perry Mason and Wilberforce and that bunch and Clarence Darrow. While that bunch of third-rate amateurs, the one you put your case into here, in, into his hand, this one, never lost a case in reality in 19 centuries. As a true man, he was tempted in all points, just like you are, yet he was without sin. He overcame sin and now offers you the same power. Now, we don't know what accusation Satan is constantly bringing to the Father against us, but I'm sure he wouldn't have to look very hard to find something wrong with us. Some may be true, many, many may be false, but if you know your life like I know mine, you know if the devil wanted to make an accusation against you, he wouldn't have to look very far to pick up something true, would he? I don't think he would. In Revelation 12:10, the accuser of our brethren will be cast down, but he's not cast down <clears throat> until the tribulation. And our departed loved ones can't, can't be our advocates. They're not sinless. Mary and the saints cannot be advocates. They're not sinless. Mary offered a sacrifice for her own purification when Christ was born, and her soul rejoiced in God, her Savior. Mary recognized the fact that she needed a Savior and offered a sacrifice of purification for her sins. Would you go to her to be an advocate for you? All right. The conclusion is simple. Jesus Christ knows all things. He can pray about temptations even before they come. Why, in Luke 22, 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. See that intercessory prayer? Luke 22, 31, I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. That is an example of Christ's intercessory ministry on our behalf as our great high priest. Notice that he's praying for Simon Peter, knowing the future, knowing what's going to take place. After all, the Lord has contact with the devil. So the Lord knows what the devil's going to do because it's the Lord that gives him permission to do it. So with the permission also came an intercessory prayer for Simon Peter. Now, should not be a great example for you and a rebuke to some of you? Why don't you allow him to plead your case in court instead of trying to plead it yourself? Instead of piddling around your little silly old sacraments and church membership and baptism and your little old good deeds and gold rule, all these hokey-pokey, hoity-toity, mammy-whammy, pammy things you mess around with trying to justify yourself, why don't you put your case in the hand of the greatest district attorney that ever lived, an attorney for the defense? Why don't you do that? There's an old saying out in the courts of law, he would defend himself as a fool for an advocate. And if you're trying to defend yourself before the throne of God, then you're a fool to do it when you can get a perfect lawyer with more experience, 
a lawyer who's never lost a case to do it. Why don't you do it? Allow him to plead your case to receive grace, strength, and power for daily living. Allow him to plead your case to conform you to his blessed image. The intercessory work of Christ has supplied strong motives for consistent and impressive Christian living. If you know the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is watching over you, don't you know you've got some morale for service? You know why many of you cowardly, yellow Christians never witnessed anybody except the man who's just been saved? You know why some of you cowardly, yellow Christians never pass out a track unless it's a, cra- a track on a doctrinal peculiarity instead of a track about a fellow going to hell? You know why some of you cowardly, yellow Christians never tell a man he's going to hell and are afraid to tell him? Because you lack the moral support, you don't have the morale of Class A troops. And one reason why you don't is you never grasp this great truth that the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is in heaven pleading for you and interceding for you as your great high priest and praying for you daily. The Christian soldier who reckons on Jesus Christ, the captain, fighting the same battle on a higher plane, but fighting with him and fighting the battle in the heavenlies, is always better equipped and has better morale than the Christian soldier who goes to combat with a lot of nonsense about not offending folks, not upsetting folks, nor to get their income. The greatest and wealthiest ministries in America today are carried on by men who refuse to preach negative truth. And you can put that down. And these cowardly combatants someday will get their discharge for desertion. The humblest believer can now rest in the love that an unseen friend is up there taking care of him, whose faithful care is unaffected by time or events. You should accept Jesus Christ, your Savior, and have this intercessor, this lawyer advocate, on your side to plead your case before the bar of judgment. He never lost a case, and he'll not lose yours. All right, on our next broadcast, we'll take up a series of studies, which will take uh, many, many weeks to complete. These will be studies on the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll not be able to uh, complete this on one broadcast, not possibly, or even two or three. The material on the second coming of Christ is more than twice as much material as is in the Bible on water baptism or church membership. There are more references to the Bible of the second coming of Christ than any church ordinance or any church type of conduct. And although we are strong believers in the local church and the support of the local church, we're not going to be unbalanced our presentation. The second coming of Christ takes up by far the vast amount of material found in either testament. So it will take several broadcasts to complete this material. In our next broadcast in theology, we'll study the theological doctrines that deal with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Until then, may the Lord bless you, and good day.